Good morning, everybody. All of you who were at Shabbat services yesterday, I mean, I, I don't know about you, I thought it was just one of the more extraordinary Shabbat services we've had at Biennials in, in years. And it was extraordinary on a lot of different levels. I want to focus with you on one of them. Uh, Rabbi Del David Ellenson's extraordinary address to us. But at the end of that address, you saw a magical moment. You saw Rabbi Ellenson anointing his successor, Rabbi Aaron Pankin. There's absolutely nothing I could add to what Rabbi Ellenson did in blessing Rabbi Pankin than to say what a joy and privilege it is for me to introduce to you the next president of HUCJIR, Rabbi Aaron Pankin. Thank you. Boker Tov, Shavua Tov, good morning and a good week to everyone. Hi. <laughs> I'd like to thank Steve Sachs for a wonderful introduction. Steve's partnership, his vision, and his endless hours of work on behalf of our reform movement and the entire Jewish world are deeply appreciated. He's a member of our Board of Governors, and we work very closely with him, and we're really delighted. And I personally am very delighted to be welcomed by him this morning. I'd like to thank as well Rabbi Rick Jacobs for uh, all of the wonderful partnership we've had together with Rabbi Jacobs and with the URJ. Rick, you and Susie have been among our dearest friends, partners with Lisa and me in building effective and visionary Jewish communities and our teacher in so many ways. I know that the coming years will see us all work together in order to form a more perfect union and college, of course, one that continues to serve the needs of our congregants and congregations with integrity and attentiveness and offer incredible value to all our members. I look forward to being a partner with you in this sacred task. So there are a number of wonderful aspects to being one of the speakers at the very last plenary of a URJ biennial. First and best of all, it's not too shabby when you get to be the warm-up band for the Prime Minister of Israel. Second is the fact that everyone else at the biennial has spoken about the book of Genesis and its final weekly portion, Vayechi, which by now has been officially drashed to death. <laughs> In contrast, I have the privilege to teach from an entirely new book of Torah, since we're now past Shabbat and onto Parashat Shemot. But most importantly, I'm pleased to be with you, what they call the She'arit Yisrael, the faithful remnant of the people Israel. <laughs> because it's really only the truly faithful who make plain reservations at the very, very end of a West Coast biennial during an East Coast snowstorm and do not run for the airport early. That truly is putting faith into action. <laughs> so in our new parasha, Parashat Shemot, in chapter 3 of the book of Exodus, we find one of the most stunning scenes in the entire Bible. God's revelation to Moshe at the burning bush. Artists of all sorts, commentators and authors, painters and composers throughout the centuries have applied their considerable religious imagination to this extraordinary vision of our humble leader Moses encountering his God in a barren desert. Imagine yourself in Moses' shoes, a tiny solitary figure on a vast and lonely arid desert landscape. You have recently fled from Egypt, you are afraid and wanted by Pharaoh and his men. Wandering, you are a vulnerable nomad grazing your flock against the stark backdrop of the rocky, inhospitable Sinai Desert. You come upon a sight that stops you in your tracks, a spectacle that actually interrupts your wandering for a moment and causes you to turn from your regular path to stop and take it all in and see the world anew. There before you, is a bush on fire that does not burn up or go out, but instead it burns on and on and on and is never consumed. And from that burning shrub, out of that most unlikely of places, emanates God's voice. Somehow that ragged, prickly, humble, and undesirable vegetative container 
actually contains the presence of God. This is the first time you've heard from God directly, and you are, of course, impressed and amazed. And from this point forward, your life will simply never be the same. Now, our rabbis teach a number of wonderful lessons based on this memorable scene, far too many to comprehensively cover this morning. But allow me to focus on one limited aspect of the narrative, our tradition's treatment of the bush itself. In Hebrew, the bush is called hasneh, from the root samech nun hey. Here's the thing. This is a very rare root, used only one other time in the Torah. And that other occurrence is actually simply referring back to the sneh in the book of Exodus, to the bush. So this unusual incident is somehow shrouded in mystery. We may not know exactly what was burning out there in the desert that day. In fact, an esteemed Bible professor at HUCJAR once quipped to me that it's possible that Moses didn't see a bush at all, but rather maybe he came upon a burning tire or a fiery cafeteria or a school bus ablaze or some other bizarre pyrotechnic wonder. But let's for the moment take the reasonable assumption that our tradition's interpretation of the sne as a bush is correct. Why then does God choose to appear to Moshe in the midst of a bush in an arid desert scene? Among the dozens of reasons offered in rabbinic literature for this literary choice, here are a few to consider. A midrash cited in the name of Rabbi Yossi notes that it's characteristic of a thorn bush that when one sticks one's hand into the bush, it goes in easily and your hand is not injured for the thorns are pointed downward. But when you try to remove it, the thorns will fasten onto your hand. And this, Rabbi Yossi says, is like the Israelites in the land of Egypt. It was easy during the time of Joseph and his brothers to enter in the midst of famine and to seek food and sustenance in Egypt. But then hundreds of years later, after the Egyptians fasten onto them, it becomes extremely difficult for all of the Israelites to leave. The bush then, to Rabbi Yossi, represents the trap of slavery and the more generalized problem of being trapped and unable to move forward. Another midrash taught anonymously tells us that the bush teaches the concept of divine empathy. This author suggests that the sne represents God's distress and sadness. While the people Israel are in distress and they're living under the hand of an evil pharaoh, they are never alone. For God too is right there beside them in distress with them. As long as they dwell in Egypt as a people, then God too can only dwell in a place of distress and pain, a thorn bush which causes pain and travail and doesn't add much to the world for anyone who encounters it. A third explanation, Rabbi Eliezer explains that the sne is more modest than any other plant in the world. It is low to the ground and humble, never standing out head and shoulders above the other plants and trees. This is, he explains, a reflection of the modesty of the people Israel, a reminder of how they are, or at least how they should be, never lording themselves over others in haughtiness, but lowering themselves in humility. A fourth and final lesson, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Karcha teaches from this bush a simple, beautiful idea. If God may be found in this bush, which is little more than thorns and branches, then that teaches us that God may be found anywhere. That implies, of course, that if God may be found anywhere, then God can be pretty much everywhere. If even a lowly, despised thorn bush can contain God, then each and every person and each and every place in our vast universe has the potential to hold the presence of God for us. Now, these are just a few of the many, many extensions and explanations of one tiny element in the biblical text. Such a glorious interpretive trajectory begins in the years immediately following the completion of the biblical canon and continues ad hayom until today, as generations have unpacked this symbol and hafach ba ve hafach ba de kula ba, as they have turned it and turned it again to find that all is within it. Here's the irony. In our tradition's interpretation of even the most lowly, most despised, most insignificant element of a desert landscape, we find all the magnificent grandeur that textual interpretation can offer. 
When we take our rightful inheritance by studying even the most minute elements of texts, when we concentrate on the details and the letters and the questions they inspire, when we open our souls to the extraordinary gift bequeathed to us by our forebears, when we actively accept and embrace this precious gift of Torah, we create the potential for limitless possibilities for growth, for learning, and for the improvement of ourselves and the communities around us. Best of all, when we hear the voice of our unique and extraordinary Torah, as refracted through the manifold lenses of those who have read it before us, and we bring our own deep knowledge and open creativity to formulate our own new readings, that is when we link ourselves most authentically to the Shalshelet HaKabbalah, to the chain of tradition that stretches back a hundred generations to Moses and extend forward through our work, we pray for hundreds more. For me personally, as the incoming president of North America's first institution of higher Jewish learning, the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, this is what our reform movement needs to be and must always strive to become. Torah study can become the blessed antidote to the incessant cries of problems in our community. I need no pew study, no hand-wringing about future and funding, no worries about dues and demographics. What I need and what I believe we need are the simple and authentic acts of teaching and learning, the humble moments when our tradition comes alive and moves seamlessly, beautifully, midor la dor, from generation to generation. It has always been the teachers in our Reformed Jewish community who have been able to inspire us, to goad us, to make us better, and to ask us to do our job in improving the world. They keep us connected and alive in our faith by teaching us their Torah. When does our tradition come alive? It is with the bar or bat mitzvah tutor, or the religious school teacher, or camp counselor, who sits lovingly with students and reads Hebrew slowly from the Sidur, and in so doing creates fluency and ease with Hebrew, comfort and prayer, and a lifelong connection so that the words of a prayer book or a Tanakh read anywhere in any shul or kita around the world will resound in their hearts and fill them with meaningful connection to the beloved home that is their Jewish world. These words, these connections, make our tradition come alive. When does our tradition come alive? It is with our elders who share their stories of birth and homeland, of disruption and leave-taking, of challenge and triumph, of persecution and ultimate redemption. When they see that personal story against the profound backdrop of our shared Jewish journey, constructing themselves as fellow travelers with Avraham or Sarah, with the ancient Jews who left for the Babylonian exile and continued to sing the Lord's song in a foreign land, with the medieval Jews who moved from Spain to new lands, who created Jewish community afresh in vastly altered surroundings. It is with our parents and our grandparents who immigrated from Eastern Europe to the Lower East Side, to Galveston, to England or Australia or Eretz Yisrael, who restarted their lives and built the communities we inhabit and are blessed by today. When our Reformed Jews see that story as their own, then our tradition comes alive. When does our tradition come alive? It is with our students who reach higher, who push themselves to grapple with the complexity of Hebrew texts and ancient traditions, seeking their relevance and application in the postmodern world, preparing for the fulfilling and extraordinary life of Jewish professionals. And everyone here today has a responsibility to assist the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in helping us find that next generation of rabbis, cantors, educators who can become the future leaders in the professional community of the reform movement. When we find them, they will find and bring to others enduring inspiration, meaning, and purpose not in the pursuit of empty fame or elusive wealth, but in the more enduring blessings of the world and the ways of our faith. They know in their souls that there is simply nothing more precious and consequential in our world than being authentic teachers who know our tradition and choose to spend their lives 24-6, 365, in the building of sacredness and goodness 
through acts of teaching and pastoral care, service to others, and building communities of conscience. Through service to the Jewish community, through holy acts that do what the latter part of our Aleinu says we always should, letaken olam b'malchut shaddai, to repair the world under the rule of God, they dedicate themselves to the betterment of the world around them. I joined this reform movement, my beloved Jewish home, at three years old, when I entered the Stephen Wise Free Synagogue Nursery School in New York City. I grew up in this movement, and I've been a beneficiary of everything it has to offer. I celebrated my bar mitzvah standing next to Rabbi Ed Klein, who was the assistant to Rabbi Stephen Wise, and I stood next to Rabbi Sally Prezand, HUCJIR's first female ordained rabbi. I was blessed to be one of the first generation to live a Jewish life in which having a woman rabbi was natural and right from my childhood. I spent years in religious school. In fact, my eighth grade teacher would be absolutely shocked to see me up here with the way I behaved that year. <laughs> Lillian, wherever you are, I'd still like to apologize for some of the things I said and did. <laughs> I've worked in our movement's institutions for nearly 30 years. Among my first paid jobs, I served as a weekend dining room assistant at the URJ Kutz Camp and as the audiovisual guy at Camp Eisner. I've been a nifty kid and a nifty regional advisor and a nifty rabbinical advisor. I've been a student and a teacher, a congregational rabbi and a professor, a mourner and a celebrator, a visitor to the sick and a sick person who needed to be visited. I've been employed full-time by HUCJIR and the URJ, and I've worked with and taught under the auspices of more Reformed Jewish organizations than we actually have time for me to list this morning or you'll miss your plane. I've been shaped by caring rabbis, talented cantors, and inspired educators, by my dear friends from our time as students at HUCJAR, by my cherished professors, now my colleagues, and most of all, by my students. I've been shaped by multi-dimensional and interfaith, multi-denominational and interfaith experiences, by time with Jewish communities at home and abroad in North America, in Israel, Australia, and elsewhere around the world. And amidst all of this, what I can tell you is that the greatness of our movement lies not in any organizational structure or, or how we move the chess pieces around on the board or any particular program or place. Our movement is greatest when it fosters loving and authentic Torah study by talented teachers to students who are hungry to learn. As I take on my new responsibilities January 1st, I must say that I feel for that thorn bush and its humble nature compared to the other plants, for I'm awed by what I see around me. When I look at the faculty of HUCJIR, their knowledge, their erudition, their ability to interpret and transmit Torah, I'm awed by what they have done and by what they continue to do. When I consider our staff, their commitment, their hard work, their ability to create and innovate, I'm awed by what they have done and what they continue to do. And when I think of that most cherished group, our students, you are future rabbis, cantors, educators, Jewish nonprofit visionaries, and scholars. You serve 400 plus congregations, camps, universities, schools, organizations each year around our movement and throughout the greater Jewish world. And you teach and you touch thousands of individuals as interns, bi weekly rabbis, student cantors, educators, and teachers. I am awed by what you have done and what you continue to do. And then when I contemplate the history, the extraordinary predecessors whose paths I now hope to extend, it is simply overwhelming. Rabbis Isaac Mayer Wise, Stephen Wise, Kaufman Kohler, Julian Morgenstern, Nelson Glick, Alfred Gottschalk, Shelley Zimmerman, and most recently, and so wonderfully, David Ellenson. Yesterday was certainly a high point in my life. One close friend joked that I hadn't even started officially yet, and yet somehow I had already managed to make the entire reform movement cry. <laughs> <laughs> to feel the sacredness, the love, the emotion when David blessed me, to be surrounded by everyone here, was a peak moment unsurpassed in my life by many. I would offer my boundless gratitude to Rabbi David Ellenson this morning for his extraordinary leadership of the College Institute, for his enormous energy and commitment to learning, for his magnificent scholarship and teaching ability, for his emotional sensitivity, 
and most recently for the many, many kindnesses he has shown to Lisa and me, morning, afternoon, and evening. I'd ask you to join me in saluting once again this Gadol Hador, this rabbinical giant of our generation, this phenomenal Torah scholar and leader who has graced our academy with his inspired vision for the past 12 years. Please join me. As you probably know, David will continue to serve the College Institute as our esteemed chancellor and as a faculty member, and most especially for me as a cherished advisor and a friend to a certain incoming president, even as he goes off to explore new areas of scholarship and teaching and add to the remarkable gifts he has given to our community. So before I conclude this morning, a few words about where I hope our College Institute and with it our movement will go in the years ahead. I've spent the last three months spending time on our campuses, considering carefully what we have built in the past years at HUCJAR, and looking for areas where my skills and ideas, and along with many, many others garnered from extensive conversations and interviews around our community, can add to the world of HUCJAR. The College Institute is a fantastic institution when it comes to educating our students within our walls. And yet, there is room to build many more opportunities for education beyond our walls. I believe the College Institute has to start sharing the secret of what we do more broadly and become a stronger intellectual center of the movement and for the greater Jewish world. In the next 18 to 24 months, I hope to build mechanisms within HUCJIR that will allow us to utilize our campuses as nuclei for learning across our movement and beyond. Nuclei, as you may recall from high school physics, are positively charged centers around which other things orbit. We will become a greater Makom Torah, a place of study for the movement, its congregations, and its leadership. We will build synergy with our movement's organizations, partnering to offer what our movement needs to keep it fresh and exciting and growing. Adding the URJ campaign for youth engagement to our facility at 1 West 4th Street in New York is just one wonderful step in building this collaboration with our partners in this movement. We will make available to you, our partners, what each of our campuses offers in the way of assets and possibilities, from libraries and archives to professors, museums, local educational and service initiatives, and so much more. Already we are the beating intellectual heart of the reform movement, and we will expand along these lines in the years to come. I dream of a time when HUCJAR can start to educate exceptional nifty kids, to raise their level of Jewish education and leadership skills, and forge a creative, exciting Jewish future. When we teach and inspire extraordinary college students to help remedy the unfortunate lack of resources in reformed Jewish life on campus. When we offer learning for lay leaders to help them build future institutions of promise and vision and when HUCJIR will give our alumni the tools they need and the fresh skills and knowledge for each of the new challenges they face as they start and continue to grow in their own careers. I dream of a time when HUCJIR hosts annual conferences where we invite our entire movement and the Jewish world's best and brightest to debate the key issues of our day from many perspectives, all informed by voices from across the broad spectrum of Jewish opinion. Let's get together and debate at the highest level reform Zionism, pluralism and denominationalism, Judaism and the environment. Let's talk about medical ethics. Let's talk about what is a responsible stance on guns in North American society. And let's do it from a highly informed and expansive stance that knows our tradition and our contemporary world. I dream of an HUCJIR where our students grow constantly more highly and easily fluent in Hebrew where we strengthen the relationship with Israel and progressive Jews around the world, where students come out steeped in the depth of Jewish tradition, yet aware of and proficient in all the ways of applying that tradition in our contemporary world, whether through pastoral care, institutional leadership, applied ethics, or through Twitter and Facebook and the internet and distance learning. I dream of an HUCJIR that continues to build and promote Reform Judaism in Israel, welcoming Reformed Jews from around the globe to our Jerusalem campus 
and adding mightily to the 89 Israeli reform rabbis we have already ordained thus far and the many other professionals we have trained in Medinat Yisrael. I dream of an HUCJIR that is cognizant of the realities of social change, yet responsive and responsible to the boundaries and ideals suggested by Jewish tradition. And I dream of an HUCJIR that will serve as a resource to the entire Jewish people to help us as we encounter our ancient traditions and reimagine those traditions when necessary for new situations, new places, and new people. Moses, when he stood by the burning bush, lacked one critical thing that we all have, the wonderful blessings of family and community. He was, in some sense, as lonely as that thorn bush. But as the snat teaches us, he was never really alone, for God was always right there with him. He was never trapped. He was able to move forward in his humility to acts of world-changing significance. And in his modest way, in his ability to be self-critical, he managed to think beyond where he was and to imagine where he might yet be. Let us rejoice in knowing that we in this great movement have each other as partners. I am so blessed to begin to walk this new road with my partners, my wonderful wife Lisa, my children Eli and Samantha, my parents Beverly and Peter, hello on the video live stream, and our extended family, which harbors a total now of four rabbis and three temple presidents, and a forecast of the possibility of more Jewish leadership to come. But I'm most blessed to walk this new road with you, our unmatched friends, supporters, and fellow travelers throughout this grand reform movement. If a thorn bush can be the place where the presence of God enters this world, that tells me that if we work together, think positively, act proactively, be responsible and careful, then just imagine how much of God's presence, how much Torah we can bring into this world. So let's begin.